Chapter 26. KALIDARIV, Hive MERADON Surface Town 3,355,397, M41. Incoming, incoming, for the Emperor's sake, pin down that squad of tank hunters before we lose another Chimera, Eperalian shouted over the Vox. The Baneblade ground through the surface town of Hive Meriden, building semi-ruinous from the Orc conquest, streets deep in sand. Orc defenders assailed him from all sides, but the Baneblade thrust like a spear point deep into the deserted settlement, trailing Atraxian heavy infantry in its wake. A torrent of fire poured all over the Baneblade, streaking tracer bullets and corkscrewing rockets ricocheting madly from all over its hull. The giant tank trundled forwards, Bannock dealing out death to countless orcs with its heavy bolters, hands twitching over the sticks. Ralt sat in Ganlik's old position, collapsing buildings with the demolisher cannon-like houses made of cards, Radon up top whooping as he let the main armament fly again and again. A loud detonation sounded, and through one of his gun augers, Bannock caught sight of a tower, A loud detonation sounded, and through one of his gun orders, Bannock caught sight of a tower toppling to the ground. Exertraxes, Quadrant 4B, our left flank, Orchid squad moving in close, Eperalian shouted. Bannock swung the left pair of bolters out, raked the building as he went past, sending their mass reactive munitions through windows, forcing the Orc rocket teams back, and then they were past, he hoped it would be enough to allow the heavy infantry to finish him off. His gun arrays were cluttered with targets, and he struggled to manage both sponsons effectively on his own. Keep your fire accurate and brief, Bannock. You're burning through your ammunition, shouted Cortin. All of them shouted, the noise in the tank the worst Bannock had ever experienced. Without the internal vox phones on his ears, he'd not be able to hear anything. The super heavy pushed on. They'd overwhelmed the light defenses at the edge of the surface town with little difficulty. Bruta had been correct, the segment of the town facing into the dust sea had barely been fortified. Hive Meriden sat on a scarp, the trailing edge sinking into quick dust land and the pans, the front rising into cliffs a hundred meters high, the main hive shaft bored right through the center of it. The main orc defense line was along the cliffs. Although the cliffs provided a natural wall, they fronted hard desert, the only direction from which heavy armor could safely approach. The Baneblade and its small strike force, having braved the quick dust to the rear of the scarp, had evaded their main redoubts and trench lines. Now they crunched their way through the town. As at Modulus, the surface above Meriden's subterranean bulk was covered with a sprawl of mostly low-rise buildings, thick, windowless walls sloped against the planet's ferocious weather. They rose higher in the quadrant they were aiming for, a manufacturing and servicing area for the large foundry vehicles the Caladarians used to sift the surface sands for Lorelei. The factory the Orcs had co-opted to manufacture their pot-bellied Titan and heavy walkers was at the heart of it. The Baneblade flattened small buildings as it went, going right through the larger ones. Sheets of hardened plastics, girders and rockcrete bounced from its hull, shaking the vehicle. In its wake, treading the trail of destruction, men of the Atraxian heavy infantry walked, supported by their Chimera APCs, eyes out for orc ambush teams either side of the way. More and more orcs were flocking towards the Baneblade, and the 40 infantry remaining seemed pitifully few. Far to the rear, the company of Lemon Russ battle tanks sat behind a lake of quick dust, operating as substitute artillery, shelling the surface town mercilessly, blasting orcs and buildings alike while the sandscum operated like phantoms around them, goading orc buggies, infantry and bikes, luring them away from the town into dust traps and ambushes. Cortine had control of the forward heavy bolter turret, letting off light bursts as targets presented themselves. Eperaliant, prepare the notification. We are approaching our target. Cortin pressed the Vox. Cortin to HQ, Cortin to HQ. We are in the surface town, repeat, we are in the surface town. Approaching secondary target. Eperalian sent of a series of encrypted data packets, confirming that the attack was on time and they were in position. That done, they were on their own. 
Below, Megan labored alone, supplying both heavy cannon as best he could. Even with two men down, Bannock marveled at the efficiency with which the crew made the tank work, Radon mercilessly picking high-value targets, blasting clanking orc walkers and light tanks into scrap, Ralt tossing the demolisher cannon's shells into the bases of occupied buildings, Outlander guiding the vehicle round obstacles that Bannock would never have seen, Eperalian doing half a dozen things at once, gathering information, sending out data squirts, fielding and prioritizing incoming communiques and acting as a de facto TAC officer for the whole task force. Vorkosigen hunted out problems and locked him down as quickly as they arose. They were elite tankers, the best of the best, man and machine operating in concert, and Bannock was proud to be one of them. They'd come through the dustpans unscathed, the Sanskum's lizards picking out a safe route for each vehicle, their odd senses attuned to the area's unpredictable eruptions of gas. Bannock had watched geezers carry sparkling cargoes of dust and steam high into the air, their range increased by the low-G environment so it seemed the plumes would reach orbit, and he remarked to himself again that despite its deadly nature, Kaladar had its fair share of beauty. He doubted he'd miss it if he survived long enough to leave. He reduced a squad of orc anti-armor infantry coming in from the left to puffs of red mist and gristle. No matter how many they killed, the orcs came on, firing wildly and roaring, no hope of penetrating the tank's ceramite and plasteel armor, yet attacking all the same. Bursts of light from explosions and weapons fire flashed through the slit windows situated round the cabin, strobing the dimly lit command deck with dazzling regularity. Steady now, three degrees left, Outlander, we're losing our bead on the factory, warned Cortin. The Baneblade gained a broad square littered with the detritus of Orkdom, stinking pits of ordure, crude shacks, slave pens, Mars triumphant ground over it all, heading to the factory and yard. Behind a high wall, orc heavy walkers congregated like fat lords at a bar. We don't stand much of a chance against that many, muttered Eperaliant. We only have to kill one, shouted Radon over the Vox, and laughed. Keep calm, Eperaliant, said Cortine. Status report. There are two operational here, three under repair or construction, I'm getting energy spikes indicating two more elsewhere. Is our main target there, is the Titan among them? Eperalian scanned his bank of instruments, checked the Piscanum equipment bolted to his desk. No, sir, the Auspecs can't pin the Titan down. Damn it, where is it, we should be able to see it. A heavy walker tottered and wobbled as it pedaled round to face the Bane Blade, head bobbing comically. Another blue black smoke from its engine units as Orcs and Gretchen swarmed aboard. The active walker leveled its guns at the tank. Prepare for impact, shouted Cortine. A tattoo of hammer blows rocked the bane blade as the orc heavy walker gatling cannon opened up. Klaxons blared, sparks flew from instruments. Bannock's right flank las cannon became unresponsive. A rocket launched itself from the heavy walker's left shoulder, lumbering into the sky on a pillar of dirty flame, but Mars Triumphant was too close, and it overshot them, impacting deep in the surface town somewhere behind, its shockwave flattening buildings in a broad circle. Debris rained down on the tank. The heavy walker lumbered forwards, crushing the wall round the factory yard, and the second followed, both spitting wildfire at the super-heavy tank. We can't take this, shouted Vorkosigen, and shot a black look at Bannock. The tarot was right. Radon howled with glee as he decapitated the trailing heavy walker with his cannon. It waddled round in circles, crushing everything about it. There are at least two remaining, Radon, and we have no idea where that Bazdak Orc Titan is. Contain your jubilance, growled Cortine. We're not going to survive this, said Ralt. Light flared, a bolt of indigo energy punctured the sky with a roar as air ionized into plasma. It struck the lead heavy walker square on its flat shoulders, cutting it in half diagonally. Flame welled up from within its guts, and it exploded with titanic violence that made Bannock's teeth rattle. Eperaliant looked up, excited. The navy, sir, the navy are on the comm. How did they sweep the orcs out of orbit? Asked Bannock. Praise be to the emperor that they're there at all, said Cortine. Put them over the Vox, Eperaliant. Commodore Spadusky of the heavy cruiser Emperor's Lambent Glory, glad to speak with you, honored Lieutenant Cortine, crackled a voice. Our main battle group is engaging the majority of the orc fleets out in the belt junction. With them out of the way, we are free to strike. Imperator Exultus, our lance batteries are at your disposal. We might not be able to engage the primary target yet, but that's no reason for us to sit up here on our hands. Cortine spoke. Please, Commodore, carry on as you were.
target those heavy walkers, we'll send you precise bombardment coordinates. On its way, said Eperaliant. With the navy at our backs, continued Cortine, we're in with a fighting chance. We'll proceed, Emperor protect you all, Spadusky out. Eperaliant sent data helping the ship target its weapons more accurately, bringing beams of high energy stabbing down onto the factory, obliterating the dormant heavy walkers. Orcs came running from the burning remnants of their war machines and the factory. Bannock and Cortine cut them apart with their heavy bolters. Sir, data squirts coming in, the rest of the battle group have engaged to the south of the city. A lull in the battle followed as orcs were drawn away to face this larger threat. Exertraxes, are you there? Cortine. Our secondary objective is accomplished, thanks to the navy, but we have yet to find the witch engine. With that still operational and the witch alive, the main attack does not stand much chance of disabling the orc device. The vox crackled, Exertax's voice faded out for a moment. Under heavy assault, we'll attempt to support you if we can. Negative, Captain, get yourselves holed up somewhere, Cortine said. We can do it on our own, their infantry is disorganized now, they're beginning to panic. No armored vehicle should proceed without infantry support, replied Exertraxes, quoting directly from the Tactica Imperium. Mars Triumphant is more than an armored vehicle, Exertraxes, it is the wrath of the Emperor Incarnate. There's no need for you to throw your lives away. The Vox buzzed loudly as another lance beam cut downwards into the surface town, its discharge playing havoc with the already tenuous Vox signals. We will proceed with you. Hanek warned me about you, Cortine. We will gladly serve the Emperor with our flesh and blood if need be. We'll be with you in a few moments. Cortine grunted. Very well, Eperaliant, find me the Titan. I've finally got a bead on it, damn thing was hiding in one of the ore towers. It's heading away from us, we are going to have to take it before it gets to the main battle line. Lance strike, said Bannock. I can't get an accurate enough fix on it at this distance sir, and the lances aren't the precise without ground level targeting data, replied Eperaliant. We're going to have to get closer. Outlander, follow Eperaliant's lead, said Cortine. I, sir. Sir. Said Eperaliant, his eyes widening. I'm getting an Imperial recognition signal. It's, it's Lux Imperator, sir. Where, where? Quickly, we have to get out of this square, Vorkosigen spoke up. The orcs, they take things, make them their own, defile the holy works of the Omnitia. They will turn our own against us. They took Brasslock, began Cortine. If they've prized the secret of how to make its volcano cannon work out of his tin head, said Radon, we'll be sitting ducks. Cortine leaned forwards into the internal vox horn urgently, Outlander, countermand my last. Get us out of this square by the shortest route possible and into cover. Aye, sir. The tank ground round slowly, heading towards a roadway next to the burning heavy walker factory. It's coming in from the west, sir. Exertraxes, stay out of the square, they've a looted super heavy bearing down on us right now. Exertrax's voice came back sharply. I know my business, Cortine, stay put. If what you say is true we'll take it on together. Continue on your course, Outlander. You sure, honored lieutenant? The driver asked. If we're in this square when Lux Imperator arrives, we'll be atomized. Our only hope is to get into the buildings where it will not be able to bring its volcano cannon to bear on us directly, and where we will be able to get within effective range. A deadly game of missionaries search, said Bannock. Exactly, you're catching on quickly, Lieutenant. Vorkosigen, get all power rerouted to the engines. Lux Imperator is three blocks distant, sir, said Eperaliant. Push it, Outlander, as hard as she'll go. The engine's ever-present grumble became a growl, then a roar. The twitch stick interfaces for Bannock's weapon systems went limp, their energy stolen away to feed the engine. There was a crack and a shower of sparks, Bannock smelled burning, another klaxon blared adding its clamor to the host of chiming alarms. A handful of screens on the TAC and comms stations flickered and went out, red lights flickered urgently on the tech console. Report, Vorkosigen. Left auger banks burnt out again, sir, said Vorkosigen. Do we have fire? Not this time. Leave it then, get everything you have into those engines. Exertraxes is entering the square, sir, said Eperaliant. On the gun augers of his left side heavy bolters, Bannock saw the Atraxians marching into the square in good order, Las beams flashing out to topple orcs hiding in buildings, Chimera turrets tracking rapid bursts of Las light in broad covering fire patterns as they drove alongside the dismounted troops. 
they made towards the bane blade. He's hailing us, sir. Put him on, said Cortine. Halt, Cortine, halt, yelled the captain. You are disobeying a direct order. Damn you, Hannock warned me about this. I'll have your whole crew court-martialed. Not very grateful, is he? Said Radden from the turret. We saved his behind, if I recall. Sir, I repeat, get out of the square, Lux Imperator is bearing down on our position. Spread your men, and get into cover, urged Cortine. Don't order me, Cortine, came the captain's reply. Look, shouted Radden. From the flickering corner of his damaged Lascanon display Bannock saw a tall building collapsing in a tumble of great masonry blocks, the picture maddeningly incomplete. A long barrel emerged, followed by the bulk of Lux Imperator, and it went out of his view. Lux Imperator is here, said Eperaliant. By the throne, said Vorkosigen, making upon his brow the sign of the holy cog. What have they done to her? Rubble bounced down from the building as the shadow sword pulled into the square. An iron moor had been welded round the base of its main weapon and additional turrets sprouted along both sides like mushrooms. Bold checks and fire spurts had been daubed on over a garish camouflage scheme. Crossed axes had been nailed to it in several places and the glyphs of the orcish language ran in broad stripes down its flanks. Cortine drew in a sharp hiss of breath. Eperaliant, get me magnification of the frontal armor. Cortine's screen fizzed as the main turret periscope focused on the fore of the giant tank, fixed, magnified, blurred, and clear. There was a man, a man reduced to a shattered torso, pinned to the vehicle's hull below its squat, immovable command turret. Is that Brasslock? asked Eperaliant. Emperor save us all, said Radon. Some of the orcish extras had been torn away by the vehicle's entrance, the remains of their occupants smeared across the tank's crude new color scheme. The majority had not, and the multiple new guns it possessed opened up on Exertax's attractions. Idiot, muttered Cortine, eyes to the periscope mask. Images of dying attractions filled his command screens, while on the chart desk the icons signifying squads and tanks winked out. They should have sent Strenkilios. They did not, because he was not as expendable, thought Bannock. Twelve dead to that initial volley sir, one chimera down, said Eperaliant. Forces remaining asked Cortine. 31, five Chimera APCs operational. Have they seen us? asked Cortine. Negative, we're hidden by the debris in the square. Exertraxes has their full attention. Eperaliant looked up. I'm getting an energy spike, Lux Imperator is charging its capacitors. The Baneblade's turret had swung round as they traveled, keeping the main scope and picked augers on the defiled Super Heavy. The Baneblade carried on its course, Outlander keeping chunks of heavy walker, orc huts and piles of rubble between them and the shadow sword. The captured super heavy was to their right and rear, Exertrax is directly across the square from it. The bane blade drew closer to the relative safety of the burning factory complex. Sir, the Atraxians are getting cut to pieces, warned Eperaliant. Outlander, keep us on course, that large structure, near side of quadrant 3, turn us round as soon as we're out of Lux's direct line of sight. Will do, sir. And get the fleet back on the Vox. Feed them Lux Imperator's coordinates, see if they can help. Radon, get ready to distract Lux Imperator as soon as we're within three lengths of the factory. Sir, said Radon, and servo motors whined as he kept the turret fixed on the captured tank. Cortine bellowed down the Vox, sharp and commanding, ordering the remaining Atraxians to hit cover round the square, while Eperaliant conducted frantic chatter over the uplink with the Navy. The sound of munitions and lance blasts howling in from high orbit could be heard over the din, but they were growing fainter, the Navy's attention moving towards the second battlefront opened by the main battle group. Capacitors charged, shouted Eperaliant. Bannock, his weapons useless, turned to watch the battle on the comms and tack screens. The additional orc guns on the Shadow Sword continued to fire. Lines of smoke and explosions erupted along its side as Chimera multi-lasers raked it mercilessly, but they were powerless to penetrate the Super Heavy's plasteel armor. The volcano cannon discharged. Inside its body, four terawatt capacitors simultaneously released energy rapid charged by the vehicle's engine. A linear sun burned through the Caledarian air. There was a rush of noise, a sonic clap as superheated air burst outwards from the volcano beam. Dust and debris blew out in a brief hurricane. The senses of the bane blade were overloaded, screens blinking out, slit windows round the deck turning into slots of painful white, and Bannock threw his hands up to his eyes. 
a titanic explosion followed as rocks and metal were instantly vaporized. A Shadow Sword's main armament was designed to punch through void shields. It had enough energy to cut the limbs from a Titan, one of the great, planet-shaking engines of the Adeptus Mechanicus. Exertax's men had no chance. A shockwave blasted out, toppling weakened structures round the square, followed by a giant ball of flame bellying from the impact site as the oxygen in the air ignited, setting everything in the square on fire. The Baneblade shuddered as the firestorm passed over it, more alarms ringing out from the damage control systems. The fury of the blast died back. Fires burned everywhere, the Bane Blade crunched through the destruction, debris on its hull ablaze. Damage, barked Cortine. Minimal, replied Vorkosigen, we've lost half our augers. Dynamo 3 is burnt out, but I should be able to keep energy levels up to normal. Main cannon functional, I think we lost the stubber. Radon. We've lost both antennae sir, comms are offline, we're onto short range Vox and signal laser only, said Eperaliant. Ralt spoke. Demolisher OK. Drive operating within optimal parameters, reported Outlaner. Bannock spoke in his turn. I've lost a LAS cannon, right Sponson Bank, the rest of the tertiary weapons are functioning. Ammunition at 64%. Megan's voice buzzed over the internal Vox. No damage to the magazine, honored Lieutenant. Good. Did we get the fleet before we lost comms? Asked Cortine. I informed him of the super heavy threat, sir. But they're concentrating on the other front, and I can no longer send accurate telemetry to them, even if we had it, replied Eperaliant. We're on our own then. How long until the next blast? At least two minutes, sir, if their capacitors are operating at full capacity, said Vorkosigen. Possibly more, we've no way of knowing what the orcs have done to Lux Imperator's main systems. Very well, Gunnarald, time to let them know we are here. Yes, sir, motors purred. The main turret view adjusted itself as Radon drew a bead on the opposing tank. It was still facing away towards where Exertax's men had been, oblivious to the Baneblade. Magnesium autocannon rounds drew lines in the air, ranging the shot for Radon. You, you used Exertrax's as bait, said Bannock. Cortine nodded, he came into the square against all sense. When he did that, it was either us first, then him, or we could use them to buy us time. Cortine looked hard at him. I cannot save everyone, Bannock, no one can. The main cannon barked once, the characteristic boom and roar of the rocket-assisted shells shuddering through the tank. The shell hit the ground by the Shadow Sword's right track, blasting a plume of rubble into the sky. Damn it! shouted Radon over the Vox. I can't get at it, it's hull down in the mess back there. Bannock squinted through his own rangefinders. The Shadow Sword was lower to the ground than a Bane Blade, its turret and command deck combined and set directly into the main hull. He could barely see its flat top over the debris choking the plaza. As long as they know we're here, said Cortine, and Bannock realized he was attempting to goad the orcs to follow them into the maze of streets and wreckage around the square, where its volcano armament would be of far less use than the Bane Blade's battle and demolisher cannons. Take us in and through the factory, Outlander. Aye, sir. The Baneblade burst through a sloping, stormproof wall whose few apertures gouted flame, and into the inferno. Rockcrete boulders and girders clanged down on the tank. Everything inside the building was on fire, the walls, ceiling and machinery. Opposite their entry point, the far wall of the factory had collapsed. The top half of a heavy walker had fallen through it, its steel glowing in the heat. The temperature rose higher in the machine, and Bannock feared they would cook, but Outlander slammed the right track off, executing a sharp 90-degree right turn. Mars triumphant burst through another wall, went up and over a pile of rubble choking the street beyond. On the main turret screen, Bannock caught sight of the Shadow Sword as it ground round on its wide treads. Radon loosed an opportunistic shot off at it. The shell went wide, bringing a wall down on the far side of the square. That's right, Radon, keep them interested, said Cortine. Any sign of the Titan? Negative, said Eperaliant. Not much activity round here now, most of the orcs have been drawn off by the main assault. We've done part of our job, at least, muttered Cortine. Outlander, take us on and round, broad sweep, drawing outwards, I want that tank in the mess with us, then get me behind it. Sir. The demolisher boomed and punched a hole in a sloping wall, the bane blade battering its way through the gap and into the building on the other side of the street from the burning factory. Within, it was dark and quiet, scattered debris between ranks of auto services the only sign a war raged outside. Redirect energy to tertiary weapons again, engineer, ordered Cortine. 
Bannock's twitch sticks came back to life. Keep going, Outlander. Cortine peered at the scope screens. No sign of it. Have you got the location, Epperaliant? No, sir, wait. There. A wall caved in as the shadow sword burst through into the building 60 meters behind the bane blade. Orc cannon fire hammered into their rear, exploding one of Mars Triumphant's auxiliary fuel drums, a burning slick of Prometheum spread behind them. Damn them! shouted Cortine. The view shifted as the turret tracked round to point directly backwards, cannon barrel automatically staying level as the tank went up and over a machine, turning it to scrap. Radon shot off a shell. It impacted square on the hull of the modified shadow sword as it swiveled round to bring its volcano cannon to bear. Pieces of armor and orcish equipment smashed into the building's machinery. Fire was beginning to take hold in this building too. Get us out of here, shouted Cortain. I'm out of ammo, shouted Radon. The shell lift rumbled up the central well by way of reply. Bannock swung his remaining las cannon round to point rearwards. He had the chance to loose off one bolt of energy before Outlander turned the tank to the right, obscuring his line of fire with the bulk of Mars Triumphant's hull. He swung out the heavy bolters on the right flank, raking the shadow sword with explosive bolts, concentrating on the weaker orc turrets ranged on top of the track units. The bane blade slammed through another wall, taking this one at a bad angle, jarring the tank and the crew. When Bannock recovered, they were outside on a broad expressway, on the upper of two levels, one curling round as it went to join the uproar coming out of the hive's central shaft. Which way, honored lieutenant? asked Outlander. The road into the hive formed a four-lane chasm in front of them, running under the square, the higher road they were on once having taken traffic off it and into the factory complexes, although it was filled now with vehicle wrecks. Down or back into the square? The square was nearer, but wide open, the expressway off-ramp worse, for a couple of hundred meters they'd be exposed. Get us back into the square, Outlander. We're wide open up here. Stick to the rubble. Cortine pulled up a desk holo of the far side of the square and highlighted a tightly packed group of buildings. Radon, we have got to paralyze that tank. If it can't move, it's helpless. Sir. Outlander swung the tank round, the nose of it squealing against the off-ramp guard wall, pushing rubble and wrecked ground vehicles into the drop below as it turned right again and headed back towards the square. The tank crushed car after car, grinding their frames and their dead occupants flat. A large truck blocked their way, Ralt blasted it with the demolisher, and Mars Triumphant shunted its burning carcass sideways into the concrete canyon beside them. Incoming, yelled Epperaliant. The sky filled with smoking trails tipped with fire as Imperial artillery began a long-range bombardment. A building's parapet on the other side of the sunken expressway exploded. It was soon followed by others. Through this rain of deadly shot, Mars Triumphant rumbled on. There was a shattering roar behind them, and the wall they'd exited from collapsed entirely, the shadow sword trundling through it. Radon fired a shot at it as it tried in vain to turn to face the other tank. It's stuck, sir, said Epperaliant, then, watch out. Orcs. Green-skinned warriors were coming in some numbers from the damaged building on the far side of the expressway. Bannock flung his bolters out to maximum rotation, holding them at 90 degrees to the side of the tank. The orcs held themselves tight to the retaining wall on the opposite off-ramp, and began to send rockets hurtling towards the super-heavy tank. I can't get at him, sir, Bannock said. Covers too tight. Suppressive fire, stop them taking too many shots. The shadow sword retreated into the building, seeking another way out. The clang and boom of orc rockets on the hull died off as the bane blade made the square. The orcs pulled back from the wall, and made to follow. Mars Triumphant crushed rubble to powder as its engines hauled its enormous bulk back into the ruined square. Shells rained down all around, the air was thick with smoke and shards of shrapnel. They were re-entering the square a third of a kilometer from where they'd left it, diagonally opposite where Exertax's men had been vaporized. A large crater cooled in the space where the Atraxians had been, although according to data feeds, some of the men and vehicles had survived and retreated into the buildings fringing the plaza. Lux Imperator incoming said Epperaliant. It's moving parallel to our course. Get us over the square, said Cortine. I want us out of its way again. No, no, they've stopped. I'm getting an energy spike. They're charging the capacitors. Where is it? said Cortine. 250 meters, 120 degrees rear right. Orcs came out of the buildings to the tank's left. Bannock drove them back with heavy bolter fire. 
The orcs withdrew, and a trio of clanking orc dreadnoughts shouldered their way out of the ruins. Bannock fried one with a las cannon shot. Return fire from their strange armaments shattered his bolter bank. Honored Lieutenant Cortine, he shouted. We've got a problem. Orc walkers, coming in. I've lost left bolters. Capacitors at 87%, said Eperaliant. They can't hit us if they can't see us, growled Cortine. Radon spoke up. At least the bombardment stopped. The tank rocked as he shot off another shell. It hit the orc's left flank, killing half a dozen and driving the rest back into cover. The shockwave toppled one of the remaining walkers, where it lay kicking its legs ineffectually, unable to right itself. No it hasn't, said Eperaliant. Emperor, said Cortine. Across the square, ruins fell inwards with a rush, a grinning orc head fashioned from metal hove into view atop a broad-bellied body, crackling orbs on insulated poles jutting from its back. A dome of energy flared into visibility every time a shell hit it. The scale of the orc witch's power had grown, for the shield encompassed much of the square. The orc infantry became agitated and excited at its appearance, rushing forwards in the cover of their walkers. Green AA, whispered Cortine. Lux Imperator's capacitors are charged, sir. They're moving again, what are your orders? Cortine had no time to reply. The cabinet took on a strange taste, aluminium on the back teeth. There was a wash of green light, and Bannock gripped at his skull. A voice called his name, his head split and chaos reigned in his mind. Chapter 27. Aronis City, Paragon Vi 2,003,395, M41. Coloron, Coloron, damn you, at least look like you are here with us. Bannock blinked, confused. He stood on the blue lawn of the gardens of the Vermilion Moon, flowers nodding in a steady, machine-generated breeze, the warm air thick with their scent. One of Tuparilio's friends stood by the door, keeping watch, a medic by him. Surely this had all passed. Bannock felt confused for a space, and his eyes, two human eyes, fell on the flowers. Amid the orangey red of healthy blooms, a dead flower stood out, petals crumpled, as red as unoxygenated blood. Coloron, said Tuparilio. Bannock shook his head, the sense of deja vu evaporated. Is your arrogance so great, said Tuparilio, that you bring no second? Bannock swallowed, his tongue dry with the aftereffects of zero night. He remembered now, the duel. Tuparilio, why are we doing this? We can stop, record a no-show on my part. Don't make me fight you, you've not got a chance. Tuparilio pulled off his winter jerkin, exposing a lean torso shadowed by lines of muscle. Another youth Bannock knew to be called Torsten handed Tuparilio a black jerkin of hardened leather. He shucked it on, proud enough not to register a win in my favor, I see. Do I matter that little to you, cousin? Do I matter to you as little as Kythela? He took his sword from the hand of Torsten, and began stretching his muscles out. Stop wasting time, get your sword and glove on. Bannock reluctantly pulled the thick molded glove onto his right hand and took up his rapier. What is this all about, Tuparilio? I'm betrothed to her. And yet you mock her. You don't deserve a woman like that, you and that orphan Bazdak Callaghan, always laughing at her and poking fun, you have no respect for the woman who will be your wife. Come on, Tuparilio, you know what Laszlo's like, he doesn't mean any harm, he's got a sharp tongue on him. He just finds her serious, is all. Sharp as a snake, and his bite is as deadly. Many times have I suffered his sting, mocking me all my life, the pair of you, and now you make a woman of honor your own private laughing stock because you are too juvenile to commit to her and the great service she will do you and our clan. His cousin's face was angry, so hard with rage the muscles in it shook. There was more to this than a young man's sense of outraged honor. There was something else. Then it hit Bannock. Tuparilio had been acting peculiarly around him for months ever since the betrothal. The poetry he was rightly famed for had become a furtive, unspoken affair. No recitals. He understood the object of his works, he should have seen this coming and he cursed. You're not in love with her, Tuparilio, are you? He asked hesitantly, trying to be gentle, his sword tip drooping to the floor. The boy flushed red, and Bannock recalled the number of times he'd seen the look of anger on the boy's face recently, the amount of time he'd been sitting on his own, brooding. He and Callaghan had had much sport of him, 
He'd been younger than him, after all. That's what boys do, but they weren't so young anymore. Oh come on, Tuparilio. He began to laugh, but the stare the boy gave him cut his laughter short. That's of no consequence. Tuparilio spluttered, and Bannock knew he'd found the truth. I've called you out because I'm sick of your venality. You are a shame on our clan and on our way of life. He began to adjust the setting buttons at the hilt of his blade. The length of it rippled as the molecules of the metal rearranged themselves, giving the weapon a razor edge. Tuparilio, what are you doing? You don't have license for sharps. No wonder he had called Bannock here. The master of the dueling fields would have stopped the fight. Damn it, listen to me. You're my cousin, for the emperor's sake. Let's stop. If we must duel, let us do it blunt-bladed, with masks. Satisfy your honor safely. Tuparilio advanced. You, his seconds, are you going to stop him? The boy Torsten folded his arms and gave a slight shake of his head. Tuparilio's other friend, a Sinkello, looked away. The medic stood by looking bored. Scared now too. The younger man sneered, and he came at the older Bannock with sudden viciousness. Coleron Bannock reacted with time to spare, but barely, moving his arm up so that his blade was perpendicular, point to the ground, the arc of the first position. It blocked Tuparilio's weapon, a subtle correction to its course that sent it whisking past Bannock's side. Bannock was in a fence's crouch by then, and responded swiftly, extending his arm and simultaneously moving his blade in a circle to the fourth position, darting quickly forwards, trying to tangle his cousin's blade and wrench it from his grasp, but the younger Tuparilio moved back almost as quick, twitching his sword twice in quick succession to block a deception and a thrust from Bannock, returning in kind with two of his own. Two more quick attacks, and the two cousins found themselves body to body, swords crossed between them. You've been practicing, said Bannock. Solely so I can teach you a much needed lesson, hissed Tuparilio. Why do you not sharpen your sword? Because I don't want to kill you, you damn fool, said Bannock, and a push from both sides forced them apart. They regained a good distance from one another and began to circle, each looking for an opening. Bannock to disarm his clansman, Tuparilio, Bannock realized, to kill him. I don't understand, shouted Bannock, parrying three wild attacks easily, the blades clanging loud in the still garden air. No, you never did. For you it was play, wasn't it, all the jibes and the jokes and the mockery. He executed a near-perfect lunge that came within a whisker of skewering Bannock's kidney. A jink to the side and a seventh position parry saved him. Three quick compound attacks nearly got through Bannock's defense, and he was forced to weave a web of steel about himself. They were sweating in the humid air of the Vermilion Gardens, but both were fit, and now they were warmed up, their swordplay increased in accuracy and tempo. Sharpen your blade. No, said Bannock, you will have to kill a defenseless man. You are hardly that, said Tuparilio, and intensified his attack. Their blades kissed and rang, rattled back and forth, time and again Bannock attempting to remove his cousin's blade. Time and again Tuparilio foiled his attacks and executed an aggressive response. Talking ceased as Tuparilio pushed home his advantage. Bannock tried every trick he could think of to disarm him, still not willing to sharpen his blade edge enough to cut, still holding back, hoping that the watch would get here and break up the fight before either of them got hurt. They forced each other back a series of paces, the blue grass trampled dark by their circling. The sap from it was making the lawn slick and treacherous. If you are not willing to fight me properly, cousin, said Tuparilio, I will kill you. Bannock opened his mouth, but no words came. He would have to hurt Tuparilio to bring this madness to a close. Sharpen your blade. Bannock looked to the hilt buttons. No, he said. Then you will die, said Tuparilio. He undid the top of his tunic, and pulled out a main gauche, prongs running either side of the blade, designed to catch and trap an opponent's sword. Tuparilio attacked again, fainting with one blade, then another, trying to step inside the reach of Bannock's sword, where the shorter weapon could be employed. Bannock saw what he was doing, and kept his distance, backing away across the lawn. Tuparilio, stop. He parried an overhead swipe, dodged sideways as the dagger swished through the air. You can only win by killing me, so do it. Do it, I have nothing to live for, you've taken and scorned the only thing I care for. Blades rang from one another. I will not be the agent of your suicide, cousin. Tuparilio tried and tried again to force a way past Bannock's guard, but could not. Bannock was the superior swordsman, but he was holding back. There was a chance here that he might get killed if he didn't think of something soon. Tuparilio's anger gave him an edge that Bannock doubted he'd have found at other times. 
His attacks became wilder and unpredictable. If Bannock had been fighting to win, he could have killed him a dozen times. Then the younger Bannock leapt, both blades drawn back, the dagger whisked past Colleron's face, the sword following in a swift circle. He parried one, and not the other. The sword swept across his left cheek, bringing with it a rush of heat and a stinging pain. Tuparilio, stop, he heard Torsten say. You have bloodied him, you have won. Honor is satisfied. Tuparilio did not listen. With a cry of anguish he leapt high into the air, both blades drawn back, one then another coming towards the older Bannock. Bannock parried one, then another. Without thinking he lunged, years of training under the dueling masters and the experience of dozens of fights taking over. The point of his blade, dull as it was, was still sharp enough to kill, and it found its way past Tuparilio's quick counter parry, and through the younger man's jerkin. Thick blood gouted from the hole in his chest as he slid down the blade, spraying red across the lawn as he slipped from the sword onto the grass. Tuparilio was dying as he hit the ground. He lifted his head weakly from where he lay, bloodstaining his teeth. You kill your kin in an illegal duel. You dishonor yourself, he said. Now Kythela will never marry you. He smiled triumphantly, and died. Bannock did not move, sword out still, staring at the body of his cousin. Chapter 28 K-A-L-I-D-A-R-I-V, Hive M-E-R-A-D-O-N Surface Town 3,356,397, M41. Bannock, Bannock, hands shook him, Eperaliant. Are you alright? Yes, Bannock said, yes, I think so. He patted at himself, then withdrew his hand sharply from the Sanskum amulet about his neck. They're hot, said Eperaliant. Bruto was right, thank the Emperor. The witch shorted out the reactor and knocked us all for six, but we're alive. The interior of the tank was dark, all systems down. A few pale warning lights shone in the dark, shafts of light coming in through the viewing slots shone bright shapes on the walls. Cortine stood upon his seat, looking through the glass. The orcs want Mars triumphant as a prize to join Lux Imperator, said Cortine. I'm sure of it, that witch tried to knock us out and leave the tank unharmed. Their infantry's coming up now. He jumped down and sat back at his station. I say we give them a surprise. Vorkosigen, prepare to restart the engine on my order. The others, asked Bannock, seating himself by his dead fire station. Me and Megan, we're unhurt, croaked Outlana. My damn head is splitting, coughed Radon in the turret. Ralt? Eperaliant shook his head. He would not take the amulet. Cortine spoke. We have to be quick. Bannock, keep an eye on those orcs. Bannock nodded and clambered up to peer through the viewing slits. Megan, Cortine shouted down the stairs to the lower deck. Get the Lorelei shells up here. Lifts out, sir, shouted Megan. With the internal vox down, they were having to rely on their own voices. Megan's reply was muffled by the armor plate of the tank. Very well, bring one, it will have to do. Radon, sir, get down here and help him, you're going to have to carry it. We can't activate the power systems until we're ready to go. Load it. Radon clanged down from above, and made for the stairs down. Quietly, said Cortine. Rumbles sounded from outside, muted battle. It seemed too quiet. Bannock, what are those orcs up to? They're advancing from three sides. Cautiously, sir, three loose groups covering each other. The nearest is about a hundred meters away and they're not charging in. The last walker is stationary. Malfunction? The vehicles of the orcs were ramshackle. Cortine shook his head. They're holding it back, in case we prove troublesome, said Cortine. Bannock went round the cabin, clambering over equipment where he had to, peering out through the command deck slit windows. He quickly checked the buildings round the square. There's no sign of Lux Imperator, he said, moving to the very front of the cabin. They must really want Mars triumphant whole, said Eperaliant, touching the amulet hanging around his neck. I pray that the witch cannot see us in here. I doubt it, said Cortine. Megan, chomping on one of his never-ending supply of cigars, and Radon appeared, wrestling the Lorelei shell in its special casing up the steps into the command deck. Cortine moved over to help them, grasping one of four inset handles round the top. If they knew they'd try hitting us again, we have to assume the witch cannot see us. The three men manhandled the shell up the ladder into the turret as Bannock kept watch. Cortine came back down the ladder of the central well and paused. 
He looked to his jacket hanging on the back of his chair, his cap on the desk. He picked him up and deliberately put him on, pulling his hat tight, buttoning his jacket to the top. Bannock, see to those orcs as soon as we power up. Outlander, take us directly towards that titan. Radon, prepare to fire the main cannon, scramble that witch's brain and get those shields down. Megan, take Ralt's place up front. Bannock, as soon as you've dealt with those orcs, I want you playing the last cannon on the left arm, got it. Megan, get the demolisher on the right, strip it of its secondary armament. We've got one chance to hit this beast, one. And we'll have the fight of our lives trying to do it. Are we ready, men? Sir, said the surviving crew of Mars Triumphant. For the Emperor, for Paragon, for Mars Triumphant, said Cortin. Now get into your positions. Vorkosigen. The little tech adept blinked his bulging eyes nervously, his skinny arms bare and slick with sweat. Sir, you can activate the reactor. Sir, it is dormant, not offline. I can awaken it, I am ready. Very well, Cortin watched as they moved back to their stations. On my mark, tech adept. Muttering the prayers of the tech priests under his breath, Vorkosigen flicked the switches and toggles that would arm the reactor for reactivation. Sound off, said Cortin. Turret ready, shouted Radon. Secondary weapon ready, said Megan. Tertiary weapon systems ready, said Bannock. Tech ready, said Vorkosigen. Comms and tack ready, said Eperaliant. Driver ready, said Outlander. Bannock looked round the cabin, at Marcelo's empty seat, at the scorched damage from shorted systems. He saw Cortine doing the same. Their eyes locked, and Cortine gave him a brief nod. Command ready, said Cortine, concluding the roll call. On my mark, 3, 2, 1. Activate main reactor. Vorkosigen bent right over his desk as he depressed the twin activation sigils, prostrating himself at his station before the Omnishia. A click, a thrum of engines. A bang. Mars triumphant roared into life, screaming defiance at the fat orc giant stood before it. Open fire, bellowed Cortine. All weapons. On the railed platform atop his gargant, Green AA surveyed the battle. He liked much of what the Imperium had. He liked this world, so he grabbed it, and like Gratstacker, he liked their wagons, so he took them. Before him the big battle wagon sat, the humans inside fried dead by the power of his own mawkishness. He could not feel their silly minds, but he had his boys move in slowly just in case. He was not a fool, not like the war boss. He'd seen the humans try to outflank the orcs position, try to attack from two sides at once. He laughed at their pathetic attempts to stop him from seeing them. They were weak, and would be destroyed. Outside of his protective psychic umbrella, artillery shells hammered down on the surface town, killing orcs and men alike as they fought. Pink beams burst through the clouds and scorched whole buildings to vapor, fusing the sand into glass. But he was safe, his power, augmented by the nearly finished Mork shout, focused by the M.E.K. No Watts within his gargant, protected him as well as a Squigoth hide shield would deflect a stone spearhead. If only Gratstacker knew how powerful he had become, he would have him killed, but it was much too late for that, and much too late for Gratstacker. Green A.A. watched the orcs approach the tank, the killer can behind them wiggling about like a squig with a broken back was hilarious, and he roared with laughter. Green energies arced from his hair, his eyes bulged, and he howled with joy. War, 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 all was chaos and destruction about him. The humans had no hope, this world would be his, and then another, and another, and another, his armies swollen by orcs drawn in by the power of the Mork shout. He laughed and laughed and laughed, Gretchen Eulers and crewmen scurrying fearfully away from him. W-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-
the little turret with its funny heavy shooters on the front crashed away, the armor on one side buckled, but it still came on. He ceased to think as an unquenchable fury took him, the unreasoning violence that existed in every orc, a need to smash and burn and win and conquer, to kill and kill until there was no one left, no one left at all but orcs, and then they'd fight some more. His powerful mind swelled with it, drawing energy directly from the immaterial realm of the Great Green where Gork and Mork laughed and clapped at his anger. Lightning arced about him, fizzing from his head, skittering up to the great copper spheres high above the Gargan's back, amplifying his power. He felt the mind of every orc on the planet, each alight with war and violence. He drew upon him, everyone, and those beyond Kaladar, and beyond this system, the great green sea of eldritch energy that surrounded the orcish race, protected it, generated by their exuberance and lust for conquest. Time slowed and Green AA ceased to see the material world, looking instead through his mind's eye, seeing the world reflected in the green of the weird. Through a crackling haze of sparks, Green AA looked down, the power was building in him, surging to be set loose. He could not hold it for much longer. Unable to speak, he slammed his palm down. It fell slowly, although Green AA knew it was moving fast, until it connected with a big button, activating the wailing siren that informed the captain of the Gargant's warp cannon that it was time to deploy. Green AA laughed and laughed as he felt the deck vibrate beneath his feet. Below him, the Gargant's tongue would be jutting out, ready to unleash the fury of Gork and Mork on the stupid humans below him, fury that flowed through him. The big cannon on the tank turret ground upwards. Green AA laughed at it, so pathetic, it belched fire, and Green AA stopped laughing. Something was wrong, there was an absence in the scene before him, in the world painted in shades of violent green, a black streak, a shell from the gun, a shell his weird eyes could not see. When it reached the Gargant's warp-born energy field, the shell did not stop. Green AA felt the strange shell pierce his psychic defenses, green energy rippling as it broke through. Green AA did not know it, but his anger was born from fear, the fear of a race which died millions of years ago, a fear that drove them to grasp at any means of survival, in no matter how debased a form. That fear flared in him now as the shell continued on into the Gargant's armor, smashed through it and exploded inside. Pain erupted in Green Eye's alien mind and he lost control of the energies he wrestled with. He tried to force them through his weirding staff, to earth everything at once and save his head. Energy poured from him and through the Gargant. One of the copper globes exploded and Green AA fell screaming to his knees. Fires burned unchecked in the cabin, Vorkosigen frantically trying to activate the suppression systems. Bannock was down to one bolter bank and one las cannon, on opposing sides of the tank, and his twitch sticks were becoming more difficult to operate. His displays popped and fizzed, most of his orbs were out, yet still he fired. Lorelei shell is away, shouted Radon, and Mars triumphant shifted as its main cannon fired. Bannock watched on his las cannon screen as the shell impacted on the orc titan's armored belly, punching a hole in the armor and exploding within. Fire rushed out of the hole, and the titan shook. It ground to a halt, but its head and arms continued to operate, hammering the tank with weapons fire. Reactors hit, shouted Vorkosigen. We're losing power. Look, shouted Eperaliant. The impact of the shell was a small thing to so large a machine as the Orc Titan, but the Lorelei in the shell, shattered and spread throughout the machine by the explosion, had done its work. The lightning playing around the head of the machine went wild, felling one of the focusing arms. Green fire played up and down the Orc engine. A gun exploded, a turret fell, a lifeless Orc with no head coming with it. The ground began to shake as shells from the Imperial bombardment once again found their way to the surface. Megan, Bannock, now. Corteen shouted. Bannock aimed at a large rocket launcher on the Titan's left shoulder, his lasbolt flew true, and the whole array went up as one. A second later, a demolisher shell slammed home, tearing the right arm from the machine. Keep it up, keep it up, yelled Corteen. What readings I can get say the main psychic shield over the hive shaft is still up, sir. We have to keep at it until the witch is dead, yelled Corteen. Psychic energies, less potent and unfocused by the machine now, began to assail them. Sir, Lux Imperator coming into our rear. Can it get a line on us? Too much intervening debris, sir, replied Eperaliant. Outlander, keep it that way, ordered Corteen. Demolisher and main cannon shells impacted in a quick tattoo on the Titan. Fire billowed out from the cracks within its armor plates, and it slowly began to slump forwards. It's nearly finished, whooped Radon. Lux Imperator is drawing near, shouted Eperaliant. 
I see it, Outlander shouted, and the Bane blade shifted leftwards. Transmission efficiency down to 54% and falling, said Vorkosigen. The Bane blade shuddered, Bannock's sticks went limp. I've lost fire control. A bow wave of green energy washed out from the immobilized Titan. A flickering echo of it passed through the tank, arcing between components and shorting out electronics, the chart table ruptured and exploded, showering glass round the deck. Alarm after alarm blared for attention, Vorkosigen wept as he tried to aid his charge. From the turret above, Radon's shouts became agonized screams. Radon! shouted Cortine. Something massive impacted the frontal armor, the tank shook hard. Mars triumphant ground round counterclockwise as the left track unit locked. Outlanners down, sir! shouted Megan. The demolish is gone. Megan, get up here now! Cortine looked to everyone. Listen to me, you're all to get out! He stood from his chair. I'm staying here to finish the job. That witch must die. The shield over the entrance to Hive Meriden must come down. Eperalian stood, sir, I must protest. I am ordering you to abandon this vehicle with immediate effect. Will you refuse a direct order, Second Lieutenant Comsman Eperalian? No, no, sir, but. I can't leave you, I can't. Cortine placed his hand on the shoulder of his number two. Leave now, Eperalian. Go with Bannock. He'll need looking after when all this is done. Serve him like you have served me. Eperaliant wavered for a moment, then clicked his heels together and saluted. Sir. Now get rebreathers and gear for the crew. Bannock, get Radon and get away from here as quick as you can. Once I've killed the witch, things are going to get hot here. They'll blast the hive from orbit, keep down and stay low. Megan came up, his face blackened, one eye swollen shut. Honored Lieutenant, he asked. Get your survival gear, you're leaving. Megan hesitated, then nodded. Megan spat out his cigar, and said nothing. He grasped the honored lieutenant's hand as he passed. Taking a respirator, coat and weapons belt from Eperaliant, he flicked open the hatch above the tech station and clambered out. Bannock dragged Radon down from the turret. He was unconscious, his eyes shut, face badly burned. He was in a bad way, but alive. As gently as they could, Bannock and Eperaliant pulled a rebreather over his mouth. Cortine moved over to the stairs, grabbing for support as the tank judded. He picked a belt of frag grenades from the shelving round the command deck's periphery and slung them over his shoulder. Vorkosigen. I won't go. I can't. Tech Adept. Sir, I can help you. You need me. Mars Triumphant needs me. Cortine nodded. As you wish. Keep us going for as long as you can. Vorkosigen immediately turned back to his console, trying to keep the reactor online. Honored Lieutenant Cortine, called Bannock. Cortine looked at him. It's been an honor. Cortine dipped his head. Get out of here, Lieutenant Bannock. Bannock nodded. Eperalian passed up out of the hatch, leaned back in and took Radon under the armpits. He and Bannock maneuvered him out of the hatch, and they were out into the battle. The others were running ahead of Bannock and Eperalian, who moved as fast as they could with Radon's arms slung over their shoulders. Bannock risked a look at the tank. It had stopped turning on the spot, Cortine evidently in the driver's seat. Green flares stabbed down at it, a rocket spanged off its thick armor. Then it stopped, the engine dying, and that was the last Bannock saw for a few moments, for he stumbled and was forced to look to the path before him. They ran on, the battle receding behind them, shells exploding left and right. A trio of atmospheric fighters roared overhead, a rare sight in Kaladar's turbulent skies, bombs dropping, hitting some target hidden to him. Sounds of a large battle were becoming apparent, as the Imperial battle group forced its way towards the strike force's position. But in the square, only the three vehicles fought. Orc and human dead lay in pieces all around. Bannock and Eperaliant, lungs laboring under the stinking rebreathers, dodged around a burning chimera. They were skirting the edge of the volcano cannon's crater where the Atraxians had died. Then they were closing on the building line. He could see a number of Atraxians peeking out from shell holes. Arms waved at him frantically. A burst of automatic fire came in from the left. Last fire sprayed out from the Atraxians in the building, covering him, and then Bannock was inside. He and Eperalian collapsed against a ruined buttress by an Atraxian, as friendly hands took Radon away. How many are you? gasped Bannock. Twelve, said the Atraxian. Suicide mission. What do you expect? But we nearly did it. Don't count the honored lieutenant out yet, said Bannock, and he rolled over to look at the scene. You can count us out, said the Atraxian. We've got three dozen orcs out there closing in on us. They've been a little timid of our heavy bolter. 
He nodded to a shell hole where a two-man weapon team hunkered down. It won't last. When they rush us, it's all over. Bannock looked out. Things appeared hopeless. The Orc Titan burned merrily, but gunfire and psychic attacks still issued from it. Mars Triumphant sat, dead. Lux Imperator was lining up for a shot, rocking as it twisted a little left, a little right, to gain a good firing solution. From the edge of the square, Bannock could see through the burning ruins to where shells and ship lance beams batted ineffectually at the psychic shield protecting the heart of Hive Meriden. Have you got a spare rifle? He asked. Delirious with pain, Brasslock moaned. But his physical agony was the least of his hurts, for one of his charges was about to destroy the other. He was cursed enough to be aware of that. Hush now, brother, said the stranger. He hung in the air before the tank, insubstantial as smoke. You, hissed Brasslock. His iron lungs were almost dead. He did not have long to live. You have returned to me. It was some comfort. You can help, said the ghost. Even now, your friend Cortine struggles with Mars triumphant. He intends to sacrifice himself to kill the witch. But he will surely be destroyed by Lux Imperator, sighed the tech priest. He was tired, the world was graying around the edges. He was dying. The tank's hull vibrated underneath him with the clangs and shouts of excited orc crew rushing to and fro as they prepared to fire the cannon. You can stop that. How? Reach out, speak to the machine's spirit, said the ghost. Calm it, make it disobey its new masters. I cannot, said Brasslock. I have not the augmenters now, and I cannot pray. Have faith, tech priest. Faith will be enough. And Brasslock reached out. His mind was foggy, but its boundaries seemed less hard than they had been, as if his consciousness no longer stopped at the limits of his skull or intelligence core. Away from himself, he felt a huge and powerful spirit, caged and enraged, the machine spirit of Lux Imperator. It roared helplessly as rough orc hands twisted at the levers of its metal shell, Brasslock felt its pain and sorrow at the changes wrought upon it. Softly, Brasslock reached out, chanting the litanies of calming in his mind, soothing the beast within the machine. He encircled it with his prayers, it calmed. He felt the capacitors as a reservoir of light. He touched them, felt a greater presence still guiding him as he bade them vent their energy through the hull of the tank. Like waters through a ruptured dam, four terawatts of caged electricity leapt joyously through the skin of Lux Imperator. Orcs howled as they cooked, and Brasslock felt the spirit of the tank sigh with release. All activity within ceased, he himself was untouched. There, said the stranger. I must go to my rest now, engine seer adept Brasslock, but I am sad to say you must remain. The emperor has uses for you yet. The ghostly young officer began to fade away. For me, tell my friend Bannock he is right to pray. He always was. Brasslock gasped, and sank out of this world. Lux Imperator was still. Vorkosigen. There was no reply. Cortine kicked at the tank's controls. Move damn you, move, he roared. I will not die without purpose. The tank's engines remained silent. A blast jolted him, and he looked around the machine he had lived and fought in for thirty years. It was close to the end now, a millennium of combat drawing to an end. Mars Triumphant was battered, plates buckled, cables and piping hanging loose, the raw air of Kaladar blowing in from where the heavy bolter turret had once sat. Cortine took a deep breath, shut his eyes, then opened them and spoke. I am no tech priest, Mars Triumphant, he said, but I ask you to listen to me now. You and I have fought together for three decades. I have served you well, and you have served me in kind. Let us go now together in fire and vengeance, and bring destruction to the enemies of the Emperor. He mouthed a prayer to the Emperor and Omnitia, reached for the throttle and twisted it. Mars Triumphant judded, the engines engaged. Tracks grinding against buckled skirts, it shuddered towards the crippled Titan. Cortine smiled. Thank you. He locked the drive levers on full ahead and went aft, ducking stoved in armor. He had to feel his way by touch, the lights were down, and the air clogged with smoke. Only a few alarms sounded, muted and dim, for the tank, like him, had accepted its fate. In the shell locker, Cortine wrapped his belt of frag grenades around a high explosive shell. He sat there in the gloom, shaken from side to side as the tank grumbled across the shattered plaza. He thought of his life, of home, of the men who had served with him, and who had died, all in the service of the Emperor. Now it was over, he had done his best. He prayed to the Emperor that it had been enough. There was a lurch as the tank's front clanged against the Titan. Cortine depressed the firing button on one of the grenades. Emperor save us all, he said. Orcs ran at them, 
Bannock fired his borrowed Laskin and the Atraxian heavy bolter chatted. Mars triumphant began to move. The honored lieutenant, said Eperaliant, snapping off a shot. He's still there. They watched as the injured tank drove itself into the Orc Titan. There was a pause, then a bang. Secondary explosions followed, and Mars Triumphant tore itself to pieces, its munitions store going up violently. The tank half lifted off the ground before it was lost to view in a boiling fireball that engulfed the Titan, the pair of giant vehicles detonating with an ear-splitting roar. Orcs and men threw themselves flat as detritus rained down all over the square. When Bannock looked up again, the psychic shield was gone, shells falling unimpeded from the Imperial artillery right into the shaft of Hive Meriden. Almost immediately the air above the hive crackled violently as the atmosphere was superheated to roiling plasma by five simultaneous lance strikes right down the throat of the hive. A series of explosions rumbled from deep in the shaft. Sudden flames rushed into the sky and the ground under Bannock's building bucked and shook, large chunks of rock creek pelting down from the semi-ruined structure, crushing men within. As suddenly as it had begun, the lances snapped off, the air rushing in with a thunderous boom. The orcs assaulting the building stopped and turned to see, the men within too surprised to shoot them until Bannock shouted orders and lesser bolts of light snapped out to reap their own harvest of death. The lances snapped on and off again, sometimes two or three of them at a time striking simultaneously, vaporizing strongpoints. The remaining orc heavy walkers, the titans less akin, trundled round to face a threat they could not assail, and were torn in two by the stabbing light. In between the beams, the air filled with shapes, teardrops of metal screaming down from the sky, retro thrusters burning fiercely to slow their descent only a hundred meters above the ground. The pods hit hard, petal doors blowing open with explosive force. Men, as tall as any orc, made inhumanely bulky by the black armor they wore, stepped out in groups from their drop pods, laying intricate killing fields of fire with their bolt guns. The orcs assaulting Bannock's position turned to face this new threat, or fled. The Adeptus Astartes, the Black Templars, one of the Atraxians in the building said. His voice rising to a shout, the Emperor be praised, the Emperor be praised, the angels of death are here. The other men took up the shout. The noise of battle cannons from over the hive's central pit became louder and louder as the main body of the Imperial Guard drove deep into Orc Town. Their secret weapon gone, distracted by Cortine's attack, assaulted from above, the Orcs crumbled. The war for Kaladar was over. Chapter 29. KALIDARIV, Hive MERADON Surface Town 3,359,397, M41. Bannock and Hannock stood by a shattered wall on the fifth floor of the tallest surviving building in Meriden's Surface Town, where a temporary command and medical center had been established. He took in silently the information presented to him by Hannock. I'm sorry, but you couldn't be allowed to know, said the honored captain. Val himself volunteered, he was the bait. Any mind of that magnitude was bound to attract the attention of the witch, and we had to make it look like we were trying to hide him. We needed the orcs looking the wrong way and Mars Triumphant was a credible threat. We had to have them concentrating on you, so the Black Templars could redeploy and the fleet could position itself in order to destroy the orc device. With the witch bending all his efforts to finding where you were, he effectively made himself blind to our true intentions. Bannock nodded. We are all asked to make sacrifices, but they can be hard to take, said Hannock sympathetically. It isn't, said Bannock. I serve. Hannock carried on regardless, carried away by his own emotions, guilt, maybe, or grief. We are engaged in a war of survival. The Imperium is beset on all sides. This is a small battle, and it needed to be finished quickly lest it rapidly escalate into something with far wider consequences. You did well. You played your part. You did your duty as did your fellows. Mourn him, honor them with your service. Bannock looked across the ruined surface town. The central shaft of Hive Meriden was marked by a wide column of gray smoke. The shells of heavy walkers burned amid the wrecks of the Hive's low surface buildings. Recovery crews worked on abandoned armored vehicles, a pair of ornate Ecclesiastes charnel trains made their solemn way back and forth, bulldozing wreckage, recovering corpses, burning orc carcasses and delivering the Emperor's final judgment to those Xenos they found alive. So the war for Kaladar is over, said Bannock. Almost so, with the warboss dead, the orcs will fall to fighting themselves. 
it is their way, if we manage it correctly, and do not provoke them into reuniting by allowing a new warlord to rise, we will be able to pick him off band by band. The Black Templars are now fighting their way into the hive to clear it. It is too valuable a source of Lorelei to destroy, and it is there that the Warlord's lieutenants are concentrated, many of the bigger orcs, the candidates to take over. It is dangerous, but the Black Templars more dangerous still. The orcs lack leadership, and as Meriden is their main stronghold, that should very much be that. He peered over the drop to the street below, where victorious guardsmen rested. They smoked and joked in the swaggering way of all men who have fought a hard battle and lived to tell the tale. Nevertheless, there's a century or more's work here for clearance teams, burning up spore infestations so the greenskins do not re-emerge as a secondary feral wave, but at least in that regard Kaladar is on our side. Hanek sighed, arched his back and clasped his hands behind it. He looked over at Bannock. The Munitorum believe that the mines here will be operational again within the month. Can you believe that? Bannock said nothing, the wheel of war and oppression grinds on, he thought bitterly. As for us, we are finished here, said Hanek. The battle group is to be redeployed. Rebellion on the plains of Geratomro or some such. Where? said Bannock. Hanek smiled. The Imperium is vast, Lieutenant Bannock. For us, the men who are privileged enough to serve with such machines as Mars Triumphant, the war will never end. We go where we are sent, no matter if we have heard of it or not, and we fight until we fall. But Mars Triumphant is destroyed. Surely I will be returned to the Paragonian 42nd, said Bannock. My secondment is pointless now, there is nothing for me to serve upon and no one to serve with. Nonsense, said Hanek. you are a member of the Paragonian 7th Super Heavy Tank Company, now and forever, he paused. Until your own heroic end at least. A hard service, but what service? We are to meet with an Adeptus Mechanicus Manufactory fleet en route to our new assignment. We are to be resupplied. A new Baneblade is probably being assembled up there as we speak. My command is to be returned to full strength. The young captain seemed happy with that. Brasslock lives, as do Megan and Eperaliant. There's nearly half a crew there, including you. Continuity is the key. He didn't mention the others, thought Bannock. Poor young Marcello, or brave Ganlick, Vorkosigen, Radon, dying in agony in the ruins an hour before Medici teams got to us. So many good men dead. And he thought of the billions more that died day in, day out, all over the Imperium, fighting for the continued existence of the human race. What else could he do but serve? He kept these thoughts to himself, and instead said, it is an honor to fight for the Emperor, a double one to serve upon such machines. I'm glad you agree. The two men watched the destruction on the plain below for a space. A wide trail of dust churning in the air marked where three full companies of Atraxian heavy infantry in Chimeras made their way to the hive entrance to bolster the marines within, unarmored trucks bearing units of Savla Chem dogs trailing in their wake. The wind carried the occasional sound of explosions or crackle of gunfire, the noise of tank engines reduced to insect whines. After the fury of the orbital strike, it was almost peaceful, and Kaladar for once was quiescent, sated by the violence racking its surface. I had a cousin once, said Bannock suddenly, a man I loved as a little brother, a boy I read to, and played with, and protected. Indeed, said Hanek, unsure as to where this was going. And what happened to him? Bannock looked his commanding officer in the eye, I killed him, in a duel, he'd fallen in love with the woman I was required to marry, and did not take too kindly to my and my foster brother's lack of respect for her. He challenged me, perhaps hoping he would win and could marry her himself perhaps because he knew he would lose and could die honorably. I don't know why, but it was my hand that ended his life, no matter what his reasons. I slew him, I became a great shame to the clan, a kinslayer. For so long I thought I could never forgive myself the dishonor, but I realize now that I fixated upon that to save myself the truth. I killed a boy I should have saved, and shamed a woman I could have loved. You joined the guard then, as atonement? Yes, sir, yes I did. There are billions under arms in the Emperor's armies, Lieutenant Bannock. All have stories, reasons why. Some will be far worse than yours. Do you think, sir, that the Emperor will forgive me, if I serve well? Sadness overwhelmed him, not for himself, not any more. Cortine had told him there would be a time to mourn, to think of Radon, and Marcello, and Laszlo, and Tuparilio, all of those who had died or who would die. He realized now that he had traded guilt for sorrow of an altogether greater kind. Tears moistened his face, tracking through the dust on his face. I do not seek honor. Honor killed my cousin, a good young man. How many more of us will die for honor, or pride? 
Do you think all this is worthwhile? If we are to survive as a species, is all this worth it? Hanek looked embarrassed and towed the floor with his boot, hands behind his back. Those are questions for a priest, not for an officer, but I for one am glad you fight with me. They fell silent. I must away, said Hanek eventually. I am to meet with our remaining tech priests to discuss the salvage and redeployment of Lux Imperator. It is repairable. They believe so, said Hanek. Mars Triumphant will be recovered also, eventually, but I believe it will be given the final rights of the machine god and dismantle. It is past saving, I am sorry for that too. He sighed. Well, Ostrakhan's rebirth needs telemetry testing, I am told, to see how its repairs held out. I expect they will, she may be needed yet. She has never let me down yet, not once. Reports to write, records to file. If only war were just fighting, eh? Sir, agreed Bannock. Sir? Yes, said Hanek. May I ask who I am to serve under? Am I to join the crew of Ostrakhan's rebirth? Hanek shook his head. You don't understand, honored Lieutenant Bannock. You really don't understand it at all. Sir? Congratulations, Bannock. With that, the honored captain went to tend to his men and machines, a wheel within a wheel within an innumerable number of further wheels, whirring mindlessly on, each one serving the Emperor's war machine. Bannock stayed, his first war done. High above the town, he watched Meriden burn, grief thick in his weary heart. Greenaye sat and watched the sands blow curling fingers over the shattered remnants of the human battle wagon and his own felled titan, Mars Triumphant's smashed hull intertwined inextricably with it, the surface of Hive Meriden smashed to pieces about them. He smiled at the destruction. The orcs had lost, but it had been a good fight, and there would be many more. The sand, he thought, each grain was like an orc, each streamer of it like a warband, each storm like a war, and the desert was huge. There were billions of orcs in the galaxy. Greenaye could feel them out there, a wall of fury and violence pressing on his mind, their mass shunting aside the other gods, blotting out the psychic howl of the devourer, dimming the light of the human emperor's beacon, the psychic presences of other species' candles to the great bonfire of orcish might. Orcs were meant to rule the galaxy, to burn it up and burn it up again, an eternity of warfare that made better and better orcs that would one day bring the universe to its knees. Yes, there would be better fights. Greenaye was not like other orcs. When he looked into the sand curling over the blackened metal, this is what he saw. He did not trouble himself over the next meal, or the next fight, or the impulsive need for cruel amusements at the cost of the weak. Greenaye had vision. He could hear the sound of men and their machines close by. They had retaken their city, killed and scattered Green Eyes tribe and were returning it to the dull grey order of humanity. Soon they would come here and cut up the machines, take their parts away, but not yet. Green AA stood. In his powerful mind he could already hear the stirrings of sprawlings out in the sands, a new generation of orcs to fight for him, and him alone, free now from Gratstacker, hacked down by the black armored warriors. Hidden from human sight by flickering warp fields generated by his insane mind, Green AA strode off into the desert, copper staff gleaming in the sunlight. If they knew he lived, the humans would hunt him, they would stop at nothing to kill him, but he was Green AA, the most powerful weird boy ever. They would have to find him first, and when they did, he would kill them. He was free, and he would make the galaxy shake at the sound of his name. Epilogue A D E P T U S M E C H A N I C U S Forge Ship P A T T E R N M A S T E R S E G M E N T U M P A C I F I C U S B A T T L E G R O U P 9876 Redeployment Fleet 3480397 M41 the manufactory ship pulsed and shook as a thousand thousand trip hammers rang out the birth of war's child, the bringer of ruin, the mightiest battle tank in the galaxy, Baneblade, 15 meters long, as tall as three men, a moving fortress, hammer of the god emperor, bearer of firepower to equal a squadron of lesser tanks. A choir of tech adepts and servitors sang the praise of the machine as the final blessings and ungents were applied to the components of the vehicle. Honored Lieutenant Coloron Artem Lowe Bannock watched as engine seer Brasslock, body now more machine than man, worked with his red-robed fellows to conclude the naming ceremony of the mighty tank. 
Behind it hung rack upon rack of part-assembled war machines, awaiting final construction on the longshop floor of the forge ship, a space-born manufactory cathedral, dedicated to the works of the Omnishir. Bannock watched with mixed emotions as the Magos activator ran through the final checks. There would be no field tests for this vehicle. The proving of its systems would come in battle, and it would fail or protect him according to the whim of the Omnishir and Emperor. Bannock muttered his own prayers under his breath. The ceremony went on for hours, the choir singing loudly, the Magi making their arcane pronouncements in ancient Gothic and Beinric, their meaning lost to the Paragonian. Eventually, it reached a climax, and Bannock was beckoned over by a tech priest who stalked on a hissing, five-legged carriage. You are ready, the man-machine barked through his Vox grill. Yes, said Bannock. It is a great honor we do you. I thank you for it, said Bannock as he was led into the machine by a servo skull. In form, the new vehicle was different to Mars Triumphant, its internal layout varied too, somehow more cramped, the equipment less sophisticated. A lesser pattern, Brasslock had muttered to him, but mighty enough. Already the walls and ceilings were crowded with parchments, blessings and devotional texts as Bannock made his way down the stairs to the lower deck corridor. He was directed rear by the servo skull, to where a young tech adept stood, tools in hand, by the blank wall of honor. With a bow of his shorn head, the tech adept set to work. Bannock watched as a brass plaque bearing his name was placed at the top of the board, the very first commander of Baneblade 3411-214, A, Epsilon, Fraxes. Above the panel where his name was being attached was inscribed the given name of the new tank, flanked by skeletal figures and angels, promising doom to all those who would deny man's right to rule the stars now and forevermore. The Baneblade Cortine's honor. About the author. Guy Haley is the author of the Horus Heresy novel Pharos and the Warhammer 40,000 novels Baneblade, Shadowsword, Valider and Death of Integrity. He has also written Throneworld and the Beheading for the Beast Arises series. His enthusiasm for all things Greenskin has also led him to pen the eponymous Warhammer novel Skarsnik, as well as the End Times novel The Rise of the Horned Rat. He has also written stories set in the Age of Sigma, included in Warstorm, Gull Maras and Call of Archaean. He lives in Yorkshire with his wife and son. An extract 